Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to a new week of studies. As we return to Daniel 11 and begin again on verse 18, shall we praise our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction and for this opportunity we have to join together to look to understand these verses and how they should apply with what we are experiencing currently. Shall we now praise him, thank him, and ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we may come before you, that we may learn and study and be prepared for events that are soon to take place. May your will be done in our lives as your will is done in heaven. As we open your word, we ask now that your spirit may enlighten our minds, that your angels may attend, watch over us wherever we are as we enter in this study. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We ask now, Father, for an additional blessing so that we may learn and be guided by you, so that we may draw closer to you and do those things that you would have us to do. Help us to this end. Direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Now, we left off regarding verse 17 and the daughter of women corrupting her. Here, Smith makes the comment that the passion which Caesar had conceived for Cleopatra, by whom he had one son, is assigned by the historian as the sole reason for his undertaking so dangerous a campaign as the Egyptian war. This kept him much longer in Egypt than his affairs required, he spending whole nights in feasting and carousing with the dissolute queen. But, said the prophet, she shall not stand on his side, nor neither be for him. Cleopatra afterward joined herself to Antony, the enemy of Augustus Caesar, and exerted her whole power against Rome. Now, is Smith making quite a jump here? Because... By the time she joined herself to Antony, wasn't that about 13 years later? That was a bit of time. Because didn't Julius Caesar die in 44 BC? Isn't it 45? Well, I'm just, I'm asking the question there too, so. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we had, so when it came to, uh, it's 44, you're right, March 15th, 44 BC. So you got, uh, in this verse, we had interpreted it differently. Right. So, um, cause when he said, thus shall he do, you know, this is God has appointed by his providence and God shall give him, Julius Caesar, the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand neither neither before him so um so that after this so that's going to be verse 18 um so he's i mean he's just he's pointing forward to the future so she's going to afterward join antony after you know after the death of caesar right and that's going to lead to uh well, all that stuff that happens with the fall of egypt I mean, historically, this is correct. Uh, I'm just looking at some of the symbols that we have here. Okay, yeah, there's... Anyway, that's, uh, yeah, that's what he says. It, it, I mean, we interpret it a little bit differently, but it's not that much different. It doesn't change anything. Well, the reason that I'm bringing this up, he's making this future application, combining... Antony, Cleopatra, and Julius Caesar. Yeah, and then he's just referring later to what happens. Right. He doesn't say the verse says that. Because if we if we were doing a direct reading of going jumping from Smith back to the Bible, after this he shall turn his face unto the isles <clears throat> and shall take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Which we're going to uh, apply to Christ. 
right? So there's this contrast between Julius Caesar and Christ. Right? But so, how would, would, would Christ be the prince of his own behalf? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's how we had it. So, so this, this part where he says, you know, Cleopatra afterward joined herself to Antony. That, that's, he's not saying that's in the text. Right. And then when we get to verse 18, we've interpreted this completely differently. So we still have Julius Caesar here. He turns his face toward the fort of his own land. And you're going to have the same similar idea with with uh, Uriah Smith. He's going to apply that to Julius Caesar. Let me see here. Where is this? I'm just trying to now I got to go back further. So we got so because that's going to be Julius Caesar. So that's. A contrast. So I'm just going back here. So he shall turn his face unto the isles. So he's going to do. He's going to turn his face unto the isles, and then later he's going to turn his face towards his own land. Right. So that's the actions of Julius Caesar. But here, when it goes to, um, he shall turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many. Then it says, you know, but a prince, and we put Michael, your prince. Uh, shall cause the reproach to cease. So for his own behalf is not in the Hebrew and neither is offered by him. Okay. Right. So, so literally it says, but a prince shall cause the reproach to cease. That's what it says. Without his own reproach, that is Christ has no shame of his own. He shall cause it to turn upon himself. That is a reference to the cross. Christ takes our shame upon himself. So what, what, what's happening here is Daniel is contrasting the character of Julius Caesar with that of Christ. So then Julius Caesar is going to turn his face toward the fort of his own land in verse 19. And, um, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. And that's going to refer to his assassination in 44 BC. So we see this contrast between uh, Julius Caesar's ambition, right? Because um, when he turns his face toward the fort of his own land, uh, this is when he's going to be, you know, given all of these honors and so forth, basically making himself out to be um, king, right? And then he's going to be assassinated. That's That's how we looked at it. So verse 18, he's going to have a way different interpretation than us. Okay. Now, the margin reading of verse 18 would render it in this way. And after this shall he turn his face unto the isles and shall take many. But a prince for him shall cause his reproach to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Well, that's better than the King James, but they're still interpreting the text when they're translating it because they're putting things that aren't, aren't actually in the Hebrew. Okay. Because, it, see, they're trying to apply this to the history. Right. Right. But, but it's not referring to what they think it's referring to. <clears throat> no. Because it just literally says, you know, that, uh, but a prince shall cause the reproach. It's not his reproach. It's the reproach. And there, that's that number, 2781, represents July 18, 2020. It's the reverse of uh, 1872, right? So so the reproach in, in the present truth application refers to this July 18, 2020 symbol, right? And he causes it to cease, and that word is uh, Shabbat, Seven six seven three, and then uh, without his own reproach, so Christ doesn't have any sin of his own or shame of his own. He shall cause it to turn upon himself. So it's reflective, which doesn't make sense in any of the historical applications. So this person's taking the reproach, reproach, turning it upon himself, and that doesn't make sense if you're going to apply it to. Julius Caesar. Okay. It does make sense in context of the cross. All right. Now, as as they continued here, 
War with Pharnaces, king of the Sumerian Bosporus, at length drew him away from Egypt. On his arrival where the enemy was, says Crito, he, without giving any respite either to himself or to them, immediately fell on and gained an absolute victory over them, an account whereof he wrote to a friend of his in these three words, Veni, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. The latter part of this verse is involved in some obscurity, and there is difference of opinion in regard to its application. Some apply it further back in Caesar's life and think they find a fulfillment in his quarrel with Pompey. But we think that the preceding and subsequent events clearly defined in this prophecy compel us to look for the fulfillment of this part of the prediction between the victory over Pharnaces and Caesar's death at Rome as brought to view in the following verse. A more full history of this period might bring to view events which would render the application of this passage unembarrassed. Now, his verbiage might have been fine for the 19th century, but yeah. it's not really working in today, in, in what we're looking at today. Yeah. Well, it's rather awkward sort of sentence structure, syntax is uh, having to written it that way. But it does go back to the fact that Smith and his, his use of syntax, especially in this, was very different from that of James White. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, well, he's try, he's always trying to be a bit more florid. Right. But, uh, or flowery, right? Um, because florid is a, is a florid way of saying flowery. Right. <laughs> but anyway um, so he says we don't really know what the verse is referring to mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it definitely refers to the cross to Christ and especially in the context that we do have a prince here referring to Michael well especially if we if we're applying the margin reading a prince for him because Christ died for all including Julius Caesar yeah, except um, it doesn't say a prince for him in in Hebrew. Okay. Right. So that, that's part of the see. So they're still trying to interpret it. I think, you know, they could be trying to apply it to a Tychus Epiphanes or something in that sense. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. So it just says, but a prince. And there is no for him or for his own behalf or anything like that. So that's completely added, which they really should have put in italics. Okay, but they didn't. Because it just simply says a prince shall cause the reproach to cease. That's what it says. Okay. Doesn't have, you know, offered by him or for his own behalf or anything in the Hebrew grammar. The prince is causing the reproach to cease. That's it, that, that phrase. So, you know, why they add all of this extra stuff there, I don't know. All right. Yeah, because I'm just looking at it here. It's pretty straightforward in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And he, it, it's really literally, and he, the prince, shall cause the reproach to cease. And shall cause to cease, and shall cause to cease the prince, the reproach. Okay. Just that's the order of it. And he shall cause to cease the prince, the reproach. Okay. All right. It's interesting as we go through this how these different pronouns are pointing to different people. And when we try to struggle it to make sense in a literal manner, we can go off track so very quickly. Yeah. Well, um, well, that's a problem with Hebrew. But here they're putting pronouns in that aren't there. Right. Right. There is no his. There is no him. Right. There's in that. And then... Uh, 
and, and there is when it says uh, his his own he has no reproach himself right or without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon himself you know that you know and it should be himself because it's reflexive not upon somebody else and it's it's also kind of strange because the only word that is added according to the translators the king james is the it so shall cause it being added to turn upon him yeah I, I'm, not, I'm not you know and i don't understand how because there's so many times the king james doesn't have things in italics right that I would put in italics you know um so i'm not sure what the basis is they have for doing that like why they when they decide to put something in italics or not now it is kind of interesting um because you know you got this word uh shuv in here but he shall turn his face right so that's the word shuv turn okay and 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 here and then he's going to cause the reproach to turn upon him himself referring to christ but there, so there's a kind of a, a literary contrast here, right? Talking about Julius Caesar, Fa Julius Caesar, Julius, Julius Caesar, <laughs> turning his face unto the Isles. Right. So I'm just looking here at the Hebrew, and, and it's kind of interesting because rarely in in the Hebrew text do we have different readings, um, but there are two different manuscripts. One's called the Kaf, and one's called the Kof manuscript that is uh and and there's a slight difference in these words okay and so by yeshev return yeah so actually i think it's the, yeah so the the cough the, the calf reading is the correct one to return so that shoe the other one has a different word Shum or sum, vayasum. Anyway, it's not going to mean much to you, vayasem, which is a completely different word. So it doesn't say he shall turn unto the, turn his face unto the isles in one of the manuscripts called the kof. And then the kaf one has the shuv, vayashuv. Um, but anyway, so his face, uh, to the coasts, the island, the shore. And then it says, and velakad rabim. So that's just, uh, and shall take many, right? So that's correct. And then, yeah, so we got this ifil form, perfect third person masculine singular. So that's the one where they try to have that. So he shall cause to cease. And the prince shall. The reproach. I don't know how they get all this other stuff in there. Okay, there's a comment from the chat asking, since the order is, and shall cause to cease the prince, can this be Rome, as in Pilate, ending Christ's life? No. Because it doesn't matter the word order. It matters the form of the words. Okay. One causing the cease, the reproach, is is the prince. Right? It's just they, they put the causing to cease. That is the prince. The reproach. So it's just it's just how they uh um now the reproach is in the feminine form, because it, you know, it's that's from Eve. Of course. Right. Um, so, yeah. So there is no way they could get this other stuff. It's just really straightforward. I'm just double checking everything. Was it this way in the Bishop's Bible? Um, well, let me see. In, in the Bishop's, it says, but a prince shall cause his shame to light upon him. Beside that, he shall cause his own shame to turn upon himself. 
So they got the last part, except he doesn't have his own shame. So they're missing out the fact that it says he doesn't have his own shame. I'm not sure why they don't. Huh. wonder why they do that. But they do have it that it's reflexive, that he shall cause the shame to turn upon himself. Because it says he does not have his own shame. He shall cause it to turn upon himself. So I don't know why they get, they, they miss that word without, without his own shame. Hmm. It's kind of odd. They just leave that word out completely. Maybe they try to use it beside that. Maybe they're trying to translate that word without. But that doesn't make sense. And then they have to light upon him. But instead of it shall cease. But a prince shall cause his shame to light upon him. Or it should say a prince shall cause shame to cease. It's not his shame. Yeah, I don't know. It's just so weird that, you know, they're because they're trying to interpret this text. But in some way. Huh. I'm just kind of fascinated by it. I don't know why they want to put his reproach. Because <clears throat> I don't see that here in the Hebrew at all. It's just the reproach. Because it's in the Hifal form, which is causative. Right? So, right. so if it's in the causative, he shall cause that is, the prince shall cause the reproach to cease. And it's not his reproach. There's nothing there that says his. Hmm. I'm just really puzzled. Why? It's just he is going to cause to cease. And we have the word. The word for prince is chief, commander, ruler. It's uh, Kasim. And then just says reproach. It's just the feminine singular now. So there's no kind of anything that would modify it that, you know, especially since it's in the feminine singular now, that's the word shame, right? You understand what I'm saying? It's like right. so straightforward in Hebrew. The prince is going to cause to cease the reproach. Right. That's that's all it says. Yeah. And the King James like offered by him. Like, where would they get that? Or for his own behalf. Where did where they're getting that? There's none of it in, in the Hebrew forms at all. So anyway, I mean, we're dwelling on this quite a bit, but it's just kind of shocking that. Nobody's going to notice that this is referring to Christ. Uh, I think um, when we were looking at Swearingen, he kind of makes a note that, you know, it, it's sort of similar to what Christ does or something. But uh, he doesn't just take it at directly as referring to Christ. Yeah, all these translations, they don't. I'm just looking at a bunch of other translations. Anyway, you can go on. Right. So this first part, first part, I think we could, you know, accept that after this, he shall turn his face under the aisles and shall take many. Could easily be that of Caesar. But the second part does not have a good reference point for us to use to point this to Caesar. So. Now, as we come to the next verse, then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. This is not referring to the prince. Here, I think we could give an agreement that this would be Caesar. Yeah, this is the death of Caesar. Now, it's interesting because the King James has three verses that are used to establish the stumble and fall, and that being Job 20, verse 8. He shall fly away as a dream and shall not be found. Yea, he shall be chased away as a vision of the night. Psalms 
37, 36, yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. And Ezekiel 26, 21, I will make thee a terror, and thou shalt be no more. Though thou be sought for, yet shall thou never be found again, saith the Lord God. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to address those portions. So in this... Especially Ezekiel 26, 21. Okay. Just because it's so similar. Now... The other thing that I was interested in was Job 28. 20 verse 8? Yeah. Because the vision, Kizayon, is close to Kazon. Yeah, they're related. So this being a first showing as a dream, Kalom. <clears throat> And then as a vision or kizayom of the night. And we know the word night there being Lila is 3915. Right. Now, kizayom uh, shows up in other places. Yeah, nine different times. Yeah. yeah Isaiah 22 and... But yeah, but I mean, it's not referring to the Kazon because that is a different number, a different word. But it's related to the Kazon. Yeah, no, it's related, yeah. But it, but it's not representing that. It's not representing the Kazon. It's just, it's just a similar word. Okay. Did you say 829, 8, or 28, 8? 20 verse 8. He says 20. Okay. So in this, Smith would continue. After this conquest, Caesar defeated the last remen remaining fragments of Pompey's party, Cato and Scipio, in Africa, and Labanus and Varus in Spain. Now let's remember, Pompey's party was the army of the Republic. So after this conquest, after going over to the Bosporus, Caesar defeats the last remaining fragments of the army of the Roman Republic. Returning to Rome, the fort of his own land, he was made perpetual dictator. And such other powers and honors were granted him as rendered him, in fact, absolute sovereign of the whole empire. But the prophet had said that he should stumble and fall. The language implies that his overthrow would be sudden and unexpected, like a person accidentally ambling in his walk. And so this man, who had fought and won 500 battles, taken in 1,000 cities and slain 1,192,000 men, fell not in the din of battle and the hour of strife, but when he thought his pathway was smooth and strewn with flowers, when the danger was supposed to be far away. For taking his seat in the Senate chamber upon his throne of gold to receive at the hands of that body the title of king, the dagger of treachery suddenly struck him to the heart. Cassius, Brutus, and other conspirators rushed upon him, and he fell, pierced with 23 wounds. Thus he suddenly stumbled and fell and was not found. Which means he died. Correct. That, that phrase, because we do have other places where, like Saul, the son of Kish, was taken, and when they saw him, he could not be found. Okay. Uh, let me see. What was that? Okay, that's not the one I was looking at. Is that the one? No, that's when he becomes king. That's not the one I was looking for. Oh, it's Psalm 37, 36. That's the one I was looking at. Um, 
I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree, yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yeah, I sought him, but he could not be found. So I think that refers to somebody dying. Okay. Anyway, go on. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Now, the margin reading would have some differences here, but would also give reference back to Daniel 11.7, which would mean, but out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and she'll deal against them and shall prevail. Yeah. The emphasis there on um, uh, standing up in his estate. So it's just the next person that takes that position. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's, uh, I guess the idea there is that this is hereditary. Is that the idea? That could be applied, I would think. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have Caesar Augustus. So we're dealing with Caesar Augustus, Augustus Caesar. It's just that the the alternate portions of this margin reading, we we can understand that in his place would give reference to someone that replaces Julius Caesar. Mm-hmm. Now. The other margin readings would render the verse this way. Then shall stand up in his place one that causeth an exactor to pass over in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither angers nor in battle. Yeah, well, that doesn't make any sense. An exactor, they're just taking this uh, taxes as to exact, but the idea is that's taxes, and especially when you put this with razor. Okay. Bar, that, that's a phrase that means a razor of taxes. So the King James did it right. I don't know what why they want to put that awkward exactor in there. Now from the chat, the comment is made, Julius Caesar's death reminds me of Revelation 18.10 at the end. For in one hour is thy judgment come, and 1817, first portion, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. Now, Augustus Caesar succeeded his uncle Julius, by whom he had been adopted as his successor. Being in a distant province, engaged in the study of rhetoric and eloquence, when he heard of his uncle's tragical death, He displayed marked ability in returning to Rome, placing himself at the head of the army and establishing himself the successor to Julius according to his design. He publicly announced his adoption by his uncle and took his name, to which he added that of Octavianus, Octavianus, Combining with Mark Antony and Lepidus to avenge the death of Caesar, they formed what is called the triumvirate form of government. Having subsequently firmly established himself in the empire, the Senate confirmed upon him the title of Augustus, the other members of the triumvirate being now dead, and he as being supreme ruler. Now, it's interesting that he, that, Smith passes over so much of the history here because, yes, you have the second triumvirate, but he's also very direct, or excuse me, the history is also very direct that that second triumvirate fell apart and Caesar's army then had to go after the others that felt that they were justified in Julius Caesar's death. Just a comment. He was emphatically a raiser of taxes. 
Luke, in speaking of the events that transpired at the time when Christ was born, says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Luke 2, 1. That taxing which embraced all the world was an event worthy of notice. And the person who enforced it has certainly a claim to the title of a raiser of taxes above every other competitor. And he stood in the glory of the kingdom. Rome stood in his days at the pinnacle of its greatness and power. The Augustan age is an expression everywhere used to denote the golden age of Roman history. Rome never saw a brighter hour. Peace was promoted, justice maintained, luxury curbed, discipline established, and learning encouraged. In his reign, the Temple of Janus was for the third time shut since the foundation of Rome, signifying that all the world was at peace. And at this auspicious hour, our Lord was born in Bethlehem of Judea. After a reign of 44 years, long according to human computation, yet seemingly but a few days to the distant gaze of the prophet, Augustus died, not in anger nor in battle, but peacefully in his bed at Nola, whither he had gone to seek repose and health, eighty fourteen in the 76th year of his age. Yeah. Now, just a note about, I mean, there's obviously lots of people who raise taxes because right. it's, it's noted in the New Testament. It obviously has to refer to Augustus, especially since all the other things that we have here um, that connect this to Augustus. Because it's after Julius Caesar. Right. Uh, there's so many interpretations of Daniel 11 that don't have this as Augustus. But really? You know, it, well, yeah, because they're 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 still dealing with the Tychus Epiphanes. They don't deal with Rome at all. All of this is just addressing Greece, right? So, so we move to Rome in our interpretation here. Other most commentators don't. They just keep Daniel eleven all as dealing with Greece. So. But, you know, it's it's pretty clear that this interpretation is correct, that we, we have of this history, that this is referring to Rome and to Augustus Caesar. Now, why was it so important for them to note the closing of the Temple of Janus? Uh, for who to note that? Smith. Oh, well, oh, it's just it's referring to uh, the time of peace. But you're, you're, what is it that you want to get at? Well, the comment is being made that this was the third time that this temple was closed. Yeah, so it's the third time they've had peace. But the third time since when? Since Rome was founded, since the temple existed, I guess. Okay. Wasn't that, wasn't that the temple of war? The God of war. No, because the god of war would have been Mars or Apollo. Okay. Yeah, I'm reading here. It says Plutarch in Life of King Numa wrote, Janus also has a temple at Rome with double doors, which they call the gates of war, for all the stands open in time of war, but it's closed when peace has come. Yeah, so she's not the god of war or anything, but they have these gate, these doors. Uh so it says the temple of Janus tied to in warfare and religious tradition. Yeah. So we're reading the same thing here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they have them closing in um, the after the first Punic War. Okay. In 241 BC. And war with the Gauls in northern Italy forced the gates of Janus to reopen, and they did not close again until 29 BC, following the deaths of Antony and Cleopatra. And then it's going to be the third time. Uh, I was trying to figure this out. Um, 
They're able to date the first two closures in Augustus' reign to 29 and 25 BC, respectively. So the exact date of the third closure remains a matter of scholarly debate. Um, the only ancient author to date, it was Orosius, who associates the event with the birth of Christ, traditionally, but probably incorrectly assigned to December 1 BC. Uh, however, modern scholars almost universally reject Orosius because Roman armies were campaigning in Germany and or the Far East at this time. Some other people say more likely it was 13 BC. Okay. Some people put it in 7 BC. So we don't know. But there was three times, I guess, up to that point. So that's what Uriah Smith is referring to. It's it's later on there's going to be closed, you know, under Nero and Vespasian, who actually has a coin with the closed gates. Yeah, because in this in this situation you have Janus, the god of two faces. Yeah, well, you know, Janus is what January is named after, by the way. Okay. So any other thought or comment with what we're looking at here? All right. Now, we segue to the next portion. Published 31st of January of 1871, which on the biblical calendar was the ninth day of the 11th month. So the last document published on the second day of the 11th month, 211, Brother Stephen's birthday, ninth day of the 11th month, 911 which I think we're all well aware of. This continues. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Tiberius Caesar next appeared after Augustus Caesar on the Roman throne. He was raised to the consulate in his 28th year. It is recorded that as Augustus was about to nominate his successor, his wife Livia besought him to nominate Tiberius, her son by a former husband. But the emperor said, your son is too vile to wear the purple of Rome. And the nomination was given to Agrippa, a very virtuous and much respected Roman citizen. But the prophecy had foreseen that a vile person would succeed Augustus. Agrippa died, and Augustus was again under the necessity of choosing a successor. Livia renewed her intercessions for Tiberius. And Augustus, weakened by age and sickness, was more, more easily flattered, and finally consented to nominate as his colleague and his successor that vile young man. But the citizens never gave him the love, respect, the, and the honor of the kingdom due an upright and faithful sovereign. How clear a fulfillment is this of the prediction that they should not give him the honor of the kingdom. But he was to come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. A paragraph from the Encyclopedia Americana shows how this was fulfilled. During the remainder of the life of Augustus, he, Tiberius, behaved with great prudence and ability, concluding a war with the Germans in such a manner as to merit a triumph. After the defeat of Varus and his legions, he was sent to check the progress of the victorious Germans and acted in that war with equal spirit and prudence. On the death of Augustus, he succeeded without opposition to the sovereignty of the empire which, however, with his characteristic dissimulation, he affected to decline until repeatedly solicited by the servile Senate. Dissimulation on his part, flattery on the part of the servile Senate, and a possession of the kingdom without opposition. Such were the circumstances attending his ascension to the throne, and as such, were the circumstances for which the prophecy called. The person brought to view in the text is called a vile person. Was such the character sustained by Tiberius? 
Let another paragraph from the encyclopedia answer. Tacitus records the events of his reign, including the suspicious death of Germanicus, and the detestable administration of Sejanus, the poisoning of Drusus, with all the extraordinary mixture of tyranny with occasional wisdom and good sense, which distinguished the conduct of Tiberius until his infamous and dissolute retirement, A.D. 26, to the Isle of Cons in the Bay of Naples, never to return to Rome. On the death of Livia, A.D. 29, the only restraint upon his actions and those of the detestable Sejanus was removed, and the destruction of the widow and family of Germanicus followed. At length, the infamous favorite extending his views to the empire itself, Tiberius, informed of his machinations, prepared to encounter him with his favorite weapon, dissimulation. Although fully resolved upon his destruction, he accumulated honors upon him, declared him his partner in the consulate, and after long playing with his credulity and that of the Senate, who thought him in greater favor than ever, he artfully prepared for his arrest. Sejanus fell deservedly and unpitied, and many, but many innocent persons shared in his destruction in consequence of the suspicion and cruelty of Tiberius, which now exceeded all limits. <clears throat> the remainder of his reign of this tyrant is little more than a dis disgusting narrative of servility on the one hand and of despotic ferocity on the other. That he himself endured as much misery as he inflicted is evident from the following commencement of one of his letters to the Senate. What I shall write to you, conscript fathers, or what I shall not write, or why I should write at all, may the gods and goddesses plague me more than I feel daily that they are doing, if I can tell. What mental torture, observes Tacitus, in reference to this passage, which could exhort such a confession. Seneca remarks that Tiberius remarks of Tiberius that he was never intoxicated but once in his life, for he continued in a state of perpetual intoxication from the time he gave himself to drinking to the last moment of his life. Tyranny, hypocrisy, infamous debauchery, and beastly intemperance. If these traits and practices show a man to be vile, Tiberius exhibited that character in disgusting perfection. Doesn't sound like Tiberius had that many friends. Now, the next verse. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Bishop Newton presents the following reading as agreeing better with the original. And the arms of the overflower shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. The expression, the expressions signify revolution and violence. And in fulfillment, we should look for the arms of Tiberius, the overflower, to be overflown, or in other words, for him to suffer a violent death. To show how this was accomplished, we again have recourse to the Encyclopedia Americana article, Tiberius. <clears throat> Acting the hypocrite to the last, he disguised his increasing debility as much as he was able, even affecting to join in the sports and exercises of the soldiers of his guard. At length, leaving his favorite island, the scene of the most disgusting debaucheries, he stopped at a country house near the promontory of Mycenaeum, where on the 16th of March, 37, he sunk into a lethargy in which he appeared dead, and Caligula was preparing with a numerous escort to take possession of the empire, when his sudden revival threw them into consternation. At this critical instance, Macro, the Praetorian prefect, caused him to be suffocated with pillows. Thus expired the emperor Tiberius, 
in the 78th year of his age and 23rd of his reign, universally execrated. The Prince of the Covenant unquestionably refers to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Prince, who was to confirm the covenant one week with his people. Daniel 9, 25 to 27. The prophet, having taken us down to the death of Tiberius, now mentions incidentally an event to transpire in his reign, so important that it should not be passed over, namely the cutting off of the prince of the covenant, or in the other words, the death of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Did this event take place in the reign of Tiberius? It did. Luke informs us, Luke 3, 1 to 3, that in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, John the Baptist commenced his ministry. The reign of Tiberius is to be reckoned, according to Prido, Dr. Hales, Lardner, and others, from his elevation to the throne to reign jointly with Augustus, his father-in-law, in AD 12. His 15th year would therefore have been August AD 26 to August AD 27. Christ was six months younger than John and is supposed to have commenced his ministry six months later, both according to the law of the priesthood, entering into their work when they were 30 years of age. If John commenced in the spring, in the latter portion of Tiberius' 15th year, it would bring the commencement of Christ's ministry in the autumn of AD 27. And here the best of authorities place the baptism of Christ, it being the exact point where the 483 years from B.C. 457, which were to extend to Messiah the Prince, terminated, and Christ went forth proclaiming that the time was fulfilled. From this point, we go forward three years and a half to find the date of the crucifixion, for Christ attended but four Passovers and was crucified at the last one. Three and a half years from the autumn of A.D. 27 bring us to the spring of A.D. 31. The death of Tiberius is placed but six years later in A.D. 37. Do we have anything to add or comment on at this point? Okay, so we're dealing with, um, going back, dealing with the arms of a flood. So he says, what's the better reading? He uses Bishop Newton. Correct. He says that Bishop Newton, that his reading was, and the arms of the overflower shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Okay. I don't know why. It's the flood. It's not an overflower. That doesn't what make is any... that word? What is that word, arms? Okay, so the word, the word arms there, uh, that's right. uh, zeroa. Um, so it's the arm, forearm, shoulder, strength. So uh, could refer to the forces, political and military. Um, it's a symbol of strength. So the strength of the flood shall be overflown. That word overflown would just, it's the same basic word as flood, but in that form, uh, shataf means to overflow or to rinse or to wash. So it's pretty clear you got one, which is the noun, the flood. So the arms of the flood are with the strength of the flood, shall they be overflown, right? That that makes perfect sense. And then from before him, or actually literally from before his face. I don't know why they don't translate it that way, um, because that's panim, right? Which is face. Okay. So, um, and uh, shall be broken, yea, also uh, the Prince of the Covenant, which refers to Christ. Uh, so that and, is, and that word broken? Broken shabar means to break in peace. To break in pieces. Okay. okay. To shatter. Well, a side note, comment from the chat, Julius Caesar had 23 stab wounds and Augustus died in his 23rd renal year. 
reminding us of the 2300 days slash years. I don't know that I agree with with the inclusion of this portion of Bishop Newton's because I'm I'm just when I, when I've looked at this I'm just not seeing. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. But I'm not sure why he thinks it's a better reading and how he's trying to apply it. Well, from what we've seen so far, as we progress through this chapter, Smith has a kind of a loyalty to the situation with Bishop Newton. He, he seems to favor whatever Newton has had to say. Well, and Bishop Newton's pretty, pretty, Bishop Newton's pretty good when it comes to these the prophecies. Um, you know, he, he's he's pretty much in line with us to a large degree. But I just don't, he, he says it's a better reading, but he doesn't really explain why. He's not really applying it in any way. Right. That's the thing that I, I don't like about it. It's like, well, this is a better reading. We'll explain why it's a better reading. How are you going to make that application? Is he saying that uh, the arms of the overflower shall be overflown? From before him, he's not really a, applying or from before his face, from whose face, right? He's not explaining anything. Now, we know that the arms of the flood, you know, these are symbols that relate to, um, you know, the Sunday law, right? The flood. So I'm not, I'm not sure how he's applying this, right? That's, that's the problem. He's, he's supposed to be a commentary, <laughs> right? Really explaining it. The King James so, reference for this verse would point us back to Daniel 11.10. Well, yeah, but the main thing here is when it says the arms of the flood, shall they, we take that as the Jews. And that this is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem, which he hasn't really addressed. Okay. Now, of course, the destruction of Jerusalem is going to be later. Right. But still, that's what's being referenced. And and the him is God's face. Right. That's God. Yeah. So the question is, like, at least in my interpretation of this, that this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which is going to be addressed later. And then what they do in the next part, they're going to deal with the Roman Jewish League, which is going to lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is a repeat and enlarge. Right. Okay. But but I, I think part of the problem that that people have when they go through Daniel 11, one is they think that it's always just continuous, that they don't recognize these references, uh, you know, back and forth. And, and why they're re these references are back and forth and why we get this repeat and enlarge, because they don't understand the purpose of the vision itself. They're just. All they're doing is they're trying to find, okay, how do we apply this? Can we fit this in somewhere with history? And, and that's not what we're doing. We're trying to understand it, the purpose of it, because these are not, it's not just given to us to know a bunch of details of the history of the intertestamental period. It, it's actually a prophecy that de dealing with the Mara vision, right? The looking glass. And um, so it's it's understanding all of the other all the other visions, right? It's giving us an understanding of the Kazon in the context of the seventy, uh, you know, the seventy weeks and the twenty three hundred days. So we have an understanding of the twenty five twenty and so forth. And then this reference, you know, again to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem brings us back to Daniel chapter nine where we have the midst of the week. So we already just had Christ here, the cross. And now we're going to have the destruction of, of Jerusalem. And we see that in the context of these, these Roman emperors, right? Well, first we got Julius Caesar, but then we have Augustus and then Tiberius. So, okay. so, uh, you know, I often say I'm disappointed. It's just that there's so much here that Uriah Smith is missing. But it's it's Seventh-day Adventists and Christians in general have missed so much in Daniel chapter 11 
because they don't understand the 2520. They don't understand the prophetic periods. Right. The thing is, Adventists had the opportunity, but of course, it's going to be, you know, hidden. Now, it's hidden partly because of the spiritual condition of the church. It wouldn't have been hidden had God's people continued uh, to understand the foundation. Right? It's hidden because, I mean, people reject it. So God hid it so it could be seen in our time. So, yeah, there's just there's so much that they miss. Um, so this has to be uh, I, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. I, I especially, I especially think of Louis Weir, Louis Weir's writings. You know, I mean, if we it, they kicked him out and then reinstated him, but uh, did yeah, the rejection. I don't think they. I believe they did give. I think you're getting they mixed with his... Mel Andreessen. Oh. Mel Andreessen okay. stated his credentials after he died. But Louis F. Okay. Weir, the person made his credentials. Well, is that how they tried to prevent him from coming to the conference? I, I don't know. Or did they? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I mean, they rejected that. They would have had 1989 or 87. 89, 1989. They would have 89, recognized. 89. Yeah. Now, there's so so much that we have missed from God's word. And for whatever reason, man just has not been willing to receive light. But we know that, that the overflowing refers to the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's typical of the Sunday law in our history. Okay. Now, when causes a question, causes a question if, uh, and I see that kind of the overflowing scourge, the Sunday law. Mm -hmm. Um, So what is the strength of the power there that will be broken? The power, yeah, the arms, the strength. Yeah, the arms of the flood. That's the strength of the flood shall shall overflow. That is, that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. That's all that's saying. It's just uh, mm-hmm. right. So uh, with the arms I'm thinking the present truth application is there. Yeah. I'm thinking present truth application is there one like uh, parallel with the Sunday law? Well, it's the There's Sunday law, like a flood. Yeah, yeah, it's the Sunday law. That's what it is. So my question. This, yeah. Yeah. So my question is, what is the arms of a flood? The, the, what is the strength of that flood? Is there something there that's going to be broken? I'm thinking, I don't know. Well, I don't know what you mean. For, for the arms of the flood mind, just means this is the strength too. with the strength of, that is the the military force in the Sunday law, right? You're not allowed to buy or sell, right? There's the death decree. That's what the arms is referring to. Just think of arms as military strength. So with the arm, with the military strength, the Sunday law is going to be enforced in our time. That's all it's saying. So that, okay. so that strength within that word definition in the Hebrew is definitely military. It's not any other kind of strength, like mm-hmm. perhaps political or otherwise. Well, just think of an army. I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Right? Yeah, that's, that's the idea. Is it's military strength. Yeah. And then the word broken, uh, you said pieces. Was there a fracturing of power when that happened, or was it just went to the next guy? Well, this is the destruction of Jerusalem. It's going to be destroyed. Not one stone's going to remain upon another. Well, this isn't Rome still. I, I guess I'm, <laughs> I, um, yeah. I, I was thinking this had to do with Rome somehow. Well, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, Rome is going to, to destroy Jerusalem. Rome isn't going to be destroyed. That's not what it's talking about. Yeah, you talk? I'm behind here. I'm behind here because I was thinking of the uh, powers that murdered each other, the guys there. I can't remember their names at the time, but you, do, you were talking about someone getting murdered with pillows and 
Oh, by the way, uh, 187, someone told me about it being the police code for murder uh, in California. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. I didn't know that. Can you, can you tie can you tie that verse with um, 15 and 16 or 11? What 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 are you asking? Can you tie that 20, 20, 22 with 15 and 16 of chapter 11? Both of them are Sunday laws, right? Talking about the Sunday law overflow. So you're wanting to tie verse 22. Can you, Todd? I didn't say. Okay. okay. No, I, I'm, asking, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to make no. the application. So the not that I know of. Well, 16 is not the Sunday law. No. No, it's not the Sunday law. And what is it? Well, it's just 1989. That's the, that's raffia. Where the part that says he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. Um, that would be the glory. That would be the Sunday law. Yeah. Okay. In verse sixteen. Yeah. Yeah. That that's going to be that's going to be nine uh, eleven in our history, which is the Sunday law. It's the arrival of the Sunday law. Okay. So it couldn't be it can be in our history now. Well, nine eleven. We're we're the children yeah. of nine eleven. Yeah. So we're yeah. in nine eleven. Okay. But yeah. So this is just expanding on that. If that's what you're trying to connect. Yeah, I was trying to figure it out. It, but it, this is referring. I mean, because you're looking at the present truth application. So in the present truth application, the flood refers to the Sunday law. All right. Right. That I sure need to review that again. How nine eleven is the Sunday law? Is there a short, quick couple sentences? Yep. Really simple. So nine eleven is is Revelation eighteen. Mighty angel of the Revelation eighteen comes down at the Sunday law. That's how Ellen White applies it. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'm going to have to review that Revelation yeah. eighteen. Yeah, the mighty down. angel of Revelation eighteen came down at nine eleven. And how do we? Apply that again. How do we figure that out? Well, that's the base, the whole basis of our message. I think if one of them, one of them quotes is you had to do with New York, ain't it? Um, she talks about well, the well, well, right. that's Mark's nine eleven, but but the, the idea is that it's the second angel's message arrives, okay. right? It's the fourth angel, which is the second angel's message, and we we apply that nine eleven has two different applications it's the empowerment of the first angel's message so it lines up with august 11th 1840 and then it's also the arrival of the second angel so it lines up with the first day of the first month in 1844 april 19th so the whole basis like since 2016 we had uh 9 11 midnight midnight cry sunday law was our line but we, we recognize that 9-11 is, when we zoom into it, we have this other line, which is, you know, all the details. Ellen White had the mighty angel of Revelation 18 as just the next way mark, right? The Sunday law is the next thing. But we, we see that as we approach the Sunday law, it becomes more detailed. So 9-11 marks the beginning of the Sunday law. Because it's when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down. Does that help? It it puts me on on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now we are at the close of our time together today. Do we have any other comments or questions? Because we're going to return to this tomorrow. Yeah. Just turn to it tomorrow. All right. Okay. So shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven. We thank you for the words of your prophet, Daniel. We ask now, Father, that we may be able to contemplate these items through this day, that you will direct our steps, our words, our actions, and help us so that we may return again to seek you and to understand what 
these passages mean for our time. May your will be done today in all ways and in all things. For this, Father, we thank you, and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.